Three. <laughs> um, how many people have already seen the movie? A fair Most. number. Well, wow. and you are willing to sit through it again. Wow, cool. Thanks, guys. I mean, ser seriously. And uh, I will say something on behalf of Ellen, who had planned on coming, but it's raining and it's dark and it's late. I have to take care of the dogs. I babysat today for Josh and Amanda. I'm tired and it's like, screw that. I said, maybe tomorrow, maybe during the autograph session on Saturday, Ellen has not been to the show in years. So I just wanted to say, because a lot of people have been asking me during the day, is Ellen coming, is Ellen coming? The plan had been yes, but of course, starting at 9.30, you know, it's our bedtime, Rob. You know, we're old people now. Anyway, I'm just kidding. But I'm not kidding about her hopefully coming. So. Josh said that he would be in the seat with you by the time Probably. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right, so we know Roger made a career in intellectual property, and I think you all, if you're here, you like the idea that there are more movies that are pinball related. So part of that deal is that this, they are still trying to make back their production costs on that movie. Hence, no videography during this session because you, they need paid copies to recoup their costs, right? I was all set to put it on my phone. <laughs> OK, so with that uh, tawdry bit of business out of the way, uh, I'll turn it over to a, another member of Pinball Royalty, Michael Gottlieb, to start our session. In uh, 1977, when my father sold the Gottlieb and Company to Columbia Pictures, they had a promotional video made, and it was a Betamax. And uh, if any of you remember my father, he was pretty conversational, but uh, this Betamax started, you know, hello, I'm Alvin Gottlieb, you know, in a voice that wasn't really his voice. So hello, I'm Michael Gottlieb. Uh, I'm David Gottlieb's grandson. Um, I uh, have been in the video game industry for about 15 years. I was in the slot machine industry for about 10 years and uh, had the pleasure of working for Roger when I worked at Williams Valley Midway and I think I probably first met him in 1976. Actually before he was born. Basically, yeah, exactly. I can't be, I, technically I can't be that old. Let me put it to you this way. I was probably two or three years old the first time my dad started taking me to trade shows. So a little bit of context there. Um, I wanted to touch on a couple of things with uh, the movie. The first thing is that from a standpoint of history, what the landscape looked like at the time. Okay, so my dad built pinball machines, but he also did whatever was required. And what was very much required over many decades was fighting to legalize amusement pinball machines, flipper pinball machines and territories, and to preserve whatever territories that they had because there was a constant battle going on basically between the fellows at Gottlieb and Williams and uh, the people at Bally. Bally was trying to convince people that bingo pinballs were the same as flipper pinballs and they weren't. Bingo pinballs were effectively gambling devices, taxed differently and everything else. So it was a very problematic time and my dad spent a lot of time flying around the United States uh, testifying in different uh, courthouses and talking to people, trying to convince them uh, what amusement machines were, what flipper machines were. He told a couple of stories where he would get into arguments with these uh, judges, and the judges would cite a particular statute and say, so what makes you an expert on this? And my father said, well, I was a consultant that helped write the statute for the United States Congress when it was originally put in the book, so I know something about this. Um, so it was, it was a continual battle of, uh, with the establishment of Attaball, uh, very important, very crucial, right, to, to allow um, amusement machines where replay wasn't allowed, and Attaball was uh, very helpful in that respect. So the point is, is that while there's a degree of like, oh, you know, this is a fun little story, this was really serious stuff, 
and this was the livelihood, the number of times operators uh, and distributors would call my dad and say, we're getting into a yellow zone here with local ordinances or whatever the case may be. We might lose the ability uh, or they're going to change the taxation and charge an astronomical amount on these machines to be able to operate them. Um, so I think that that made my father a kindred spirit to the cause that Roger was pursuing, and he understood the importance of it. And by 1976, it, it was a battle that Dad had been fighting for several decades. Yep. Secondly, to say that uh, the coin-op, first of all, the coin-op industry, again, for context, family businesses, not corporations, not publicly traded, these were family businesses, and they were very, very private. Why? Because in most instances, all press is bad press. When you were in coin-op back in those days, people would accuse you of being affiliated or this, that, or the other thing. You know, I wear my last name proudly, but I will also tell you the number of instances where I had somebody in a classroom when I was a student read off my name and go, oh, pinball machines, huh? I say, yeah, they go, oh, Jewish mafia. Perfect, triple word score, anti-Semitic, and you've insulted me, right? So that, that was the reality of the day, though. There was, there was a challenge with the uh, perception of the product and the people that were involved in their manufacture. Consequently, it was a very, very closed business, a very private business, and uh, they didn't want to talk to people from the outside. And, you know, Roger made the rounds, and the people that initially were willing to speak with him, the line was, okay, well, maybe I'll speak with you, but there's no way you're speaking to Gottlieb. Nobody gets inside of those four walls, and the family doesn't talk. And that was true. That was totally and completely true. It became almost like a double dare. Exactly. <laughs> in every one, yeah, you're never going to get in. They're never going to open up the doors like we are. They're never going to share the information like we have shared with you. Good luck. Right. There was, there was no way that it was going to happen. But it did. And Roger sat down with my father, and I think that there was a uh, very deep connection established uh, very early on. Uh, I'm going to try not get choked up because it's 10 years. This is 10 years to basically within a couple of days of when dad passed. Um, but uh, I think that by the time Roger was done interviewing my father and getting to know my father, not only did Roger know about D. Gottlieb and company, he knew the personal life story of Alvin Gottlieb. Yes. And Roger sat down in dad's office and said, I, you know, Mr. Gottlieb, I want to write a book about the pinball industry. And my father said, oh, hold on a second, hold on. And he reached underneath this big desk that he had, and he pulled out a shoebox. And Roger said, what's that? And he said, well, this is filled with letters of all the people who are going to write books about pinball machines. <laughs> but a connection was formed, which became a lifelong, very deep friendship with all of the Gottlieb family. And um, <laughs> yeah, and, and, and so. Uh, Dad opened up to Roger and told stories that he hadn't told anyone for, for decades. Uh, the history, um, the Great Depression, World War II, all, uh, very, there was a lot. Let's I mean, look, the, the key ingredient, and I, I don't want to belabor all of this. I know you guys are anxious to watch the movie. Uh, you know, maybe at some point in time we can get into some of this other information, which I still find interesting but I'm an old person, so for me, anything that predates whatever black and white TV still seems to be relevant. So again, not wanting to bore anybody, I am blessed by Michael taking the time, taking the time to actually come out here specifically for this. Uh, I will say that, you know, in regard to the movie, for those who haven't seen it, uh, okay, hopefully you'll enjoy it. Uh, for those who have, hopefully seeing it a second or a third or a, 84th time, hopefully it doesn't become boring and trite. Um, how many people are familiar with my pinball book? Wow, fair number. Okay, I mean, that's the genesis for a lot of this. And I think, as Michael and I were talking earlier, 
because we haven't seen each other in a few years, even though we stay in touch. I came around at the right time, pure and simple. Uh, the people featured here by actors, myself included, um, were still alive. You know, Harry Williams, Alvin Gottlieb, Sam Ginsberg, Herb Jones. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Even contemporaries who were just starting, somebody like Steve Ritchie, a young little person. You know, Greg Ferris, a young little person going into an art department with Dave Christensen. I mean, I can recount all of those people. And for those who have been coming to Expo, not necessarily for 39 years, I've done 38. I stopped for COVID once. Sorry, I wasn't willing, even though Rob was pleading, just come in the front door. You don't even have to come in. Just come to the front door and then leave and you're fine. And I was like, sorry, no, but I came back last year. The point that I was going to make is that, truthfully, the Steve Kordaks, the Norm Clarks, those names that just kind of resonate with us archivally, the people who are the latter-day heroes of what comprised the next generation of designers, the Greg Kamicks, the Jim Pantlas, the Mark Ritchie, Steve Rich, I mean, the list goes on and on. I mean, it's remarkable to see what that journey was, and more importantly for me at a less advanced age, to be able to meet with fellows who, again, embraced somehow, believed in me somehow, were able to give up their secrets some way, shape, or form, they were old enough to be my father and grandfathers, and yet we had a symbiotic relationship with pinball. We had a passion. We had an understanding. We had a love affair. I mean, they carved out their lives based on that. My life was going to be totally different, and lo and behold, um, it's a phrase that's used. I know that Gary has used it a lot. Harry came up with it. It's become a standard. The ball is wild. Well, guess what? So is life. And I think sometimes when you do follow, not even a dream, when you follow a door being open, what Rob created almost 40 years ago, thinking that let me pay tribute to the old guard, the Harvey Heises of the world and others that people have forgotten. I want to create something for this community that's not even a community yet and have them share their stories, share their experiences, share their games. I mean, the magnificence of being able to do that and open up everybody's eyes, literally the thousands of shows that now take place around the world. That's the OG. He started it. So again, off the cuff, I know taking too long, but those who know me know that I speak in paragraphs, not in sentences. My apologies. I do not know what the plan is tonight. I don't want to put Rob on the spot. When I've done film festivals and screenings in the past, there's been Q&A in the past at the end. If we want to do that and it's formal, that's fine. If it's informal, I will not abandon you. So anybody who has questions or whatever else, for Michael, who may or may not stay, he may go to sleep because he's tired. He's an old person who acts really old. I'm an old person who doesn't know any better. So again, I'll turn it back over to my moderator. Oh my lord! Oh, so to 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 um, Roger's point, I, I do want to say that I was at dinner in uh, 1985 when Rob Burke sat down and explained a dream that he had and what Pinball Expo was going to be. Uh, and let me interject. Uh, bone Busters, for those who want to know what the game was. Go ahead. That's right. Bone Busters was the game. And, and, he's, and he explained to my father what he wanted to do, and he said, but I can't do it without your help. And Dad said, I'll be there. And Dad took archival uh, photos and made slides and did a pretty substantial slide presentation in 1985. And, and uh, Rob and the whole Burke family have become a close friend of the Gottliebs through uh, the last several <laughs> decades. The, the old Holiday Inn by the airport for those who may That's or may right. not be alive at the time. That's right. Um, the last point I wanted to make about the movie, and many of you have seen it, so you'll know what I mean when I say this. Uh, it's a love story. This movie is a love story, and this movie is about a very strong, determined woman that wasn't going to let anything get in her way of her path, her dreams, making sure what was best for her child, Seth, 
And what struck me as so poignant is that in many instances in film, uh, you know, certain personality types are caricatures, right? If it's a feminist, it's like Norma Ray or, or Gl a Gloria Steinem type thing, right? Or it's this other thing, but the thing is, is that Ellen's the real thing, and she's always been that. And it's a story where I think Ellen would have, con you know, the, the fact that uh, Roger came along is, is magical, but uh, it's a love story and a story of strength and perseverance and a, a mother that, you know, loved, uh, loved a child. When my wife and I got married, um, Roger and Ellen came to the wedding and Ellen picked out a wedding gift for us. And the thing about age is when you're a kid, sometimes you'll read something, get something, see something, and you, you, know, you think it means one thing, but then 10, 20, 30 years later, it means something else. Alan Sharp gave us this little sculpture, and it was two pieces of wood, and one piece of wood fit into the other piece of wood. And at the time, I didn't really think anything of it. But then now I look at that, and I look at my wife, and I look at Roger and Alan, and I realize that the one piece can exist with a hole in it by itself, but really for it to be complete, those two pieces need to be together. <laughs> okay, well, now, now that we've reached an emotional conclusion here of some sort, my God, Jesus. <laughs> um, so, uh, again, as I said, hopefully Ellen will, will be coming. Um, I'll, I'll share a couple of things, and then we'll, we'll go. I mean, don't worry. I'm sorry. I know we're running late, probably. Always my fault. Um, yesterday marked two years from the start of production on the movie. I mean, whether we get into this at the end and Rob says, hey, everybody has to go and leave, go back to wherever, uh, I will share very briefly with you. It was a COVID project. Uh, it started by a random left field email in February of 20. Everything was done via Zoom and whatever else. And it was October 18th in uh, Newburgh, New York, uh, where production started for 22 days. Uh, I was there for eight of those days uh, during production. But uh, when I looked at my calendar, it was like, Christ, has it really been two years? The movie was officially kind of finished, finished uh, in the... Uh, late spring of 22, so about a year and a quarter ago, although maybe for yourselves, maybe for me, it feels like it's been around for like the last 10 years. So anyway, without any further ado, wait, the one, the only, let me introduce him. Uh, this is Rob Burke, for those who don't know him. Thanks, Raj. No, the only bad thing about these two guys being up front is they didn't give me a chance to go up there and cry with you guys. So uh, here's my little story about uh, Mike's dad, Alvin. When I decided to do the expo, I said to myself, <clears throat> first of all, we need to have the support of the industry, so it's got to be in Chicago. And then number two, uh, I need to have a, <clears throat> a great speaker for the banquet. So that's when I went to see him, and I, I went to their home, and I'm thinking that I'm going to be going to one of these gated properties, you know, with uh, the lions there and the, the mansion, the whole smear. And it was just a, you know, a very nice, humble home and, uh, in Elmhurst, if I believe. And uh, I, Alvin answered the door, and I thought he'd be in a suit and tie and uh, Gucci clothes and the whole smear. And he was just the blue and blue jeans. The man, he's like one of us. And uh, he was very easygoing and, and very cordial. And uh, he heard my story. He says, of course I'd help you out. So uh, it was a great time. I miss your dad too, buddy. He was a great guy. So anyways, uh, I want to say that. And uh, Roger, uh, the story of Roger is he worked for Gentleman's Quarterly. So when I was uh, back in my 20s, I wanted to be you know, a GQ kind of guy. Hey, baby, what's up? And uh, I figured if I hang with Roger, and he give me some tips. But the only tip was it says, you know, do your homework and stay what you're doing. But anyways, uh, guys, it's so great. Yeah, 1986. 1986, we had pictures side by side. So a lot of great memories being here in the, in the uh, 
Expo and uh, meeting a lot of faces, a lot of people that passed away. But for those of you that are new uh, pre, uh, Expo uh, attendees, it's hard for you to connect like it is for us with the Harvey High stories they had at the old Expos. I mean, people would shudder when he talked because they were kind of off color. But we didn't care because it was Harvey. He was 85 years old at the time. I remember another time we were, we were um, giving a toast to Steve Kordek. And uh, Harvey came up front and talked about the days at Genko. <clears throat> and so one of the stories was, and then there was a girl that worked at Genko by the name of Mary. Right. So Steve Kordek put his head down and with his hand to cover his mouth, cut it, Harvey, cut it, cut it, Harvey. <laughs> so I heard it because I was up front. But one final story leading up to that, um, I spoke to Elvin and I said, I'd like to have you show you as the banquet speaker, but we're going to turn the tide. And I said, what I want to do is I'm going to have you start talking at the banquet, but then I'm going to interrupt you. Yeah, I'm going to interrupt you, and, and then uh, then we're going to introduce Kordick. So uh, he said, okay, I'm talking about C.A. Robinson. I can't remember who the gentleman was exactly in California. So whenever I heard that name, he says, then you can interrupt me. So imagine, in 85, everyone worshipped Alvin Gollum. I mean, they literally bowed down around him. Just they couldn't believe that this icon was around, walking around us. And um, so he's sitting next to me, and he gets up and starts talking. And about five minutes later, I hear that word, that guy's name. So I stand up very slowly, and I look at him. I said, can't you speak about something more interesting? Well, you could have seen the crowd. They're like, what are you doing talking to him like that? Well, that was part of the whole gig. And uh, with the rest of his history, we, we honored Cordic that day, and it was a great time. Great memories. All right, guys. Yeah. Ready? David? Well, I don't know about that. But, uh, <laughs> How many people have been to uh, less than five expos? Wow. That's great. Uh, let me ask you a different way. How many is this the first? Wow. Well, welcome. Yes. Uh, it becomes an affliction. So I'm just letting you know that uh, next year around this time, you may find yourself <laughs> thinking, oh, I, I have to get to Pinball Expo. So uh, hopefully that becomes part of uh, – Right. Hopefully that becomes part of your routine, along with supporting all the other shows, events, and everything else. Uh, so, uh, you know, keep it alive. Uh, for old people like me, it's great to see uh, new generations and new people coming in uh, and hopefully enjoying and savoring it all. Uh, understand that whatever exists today doesn't exist without yesterday. And how we got here, whether it's the people, whether it's the technology, whether it's the passion, uh, the innovation, the ability to really challenge oneself in all areas of design, manufacturing, support, whether it's dealers, distributors, all the rest of it, all of you play a part in that. So, you know, it's up to you to pass on the baton the way that I have with my sons for some bizarre reason, the way that my grandchildren now embrace this at all as well, which is also frightening to see a four and a half year old play as well as he does, knowing exactly what he should be doing as well as a five-year-old doing much the same. So anyway, uh, I thank you for your support for Expo and for Pinball, and more importantly, for taking the time out of what I know is going to be a busy schedule. Yes, please. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, talking about the history. Yeah. I told a couple of people I was going to go there, and uh, Chicago is the, like the pinball capital of the world. Yes. Okay, well, no, I mean, in, in all honesty, uh, some of it's the migration of uh, a workforce coming in. Uh, Chicago at one time, I think it still is, has the largest Polish population outside of Poland, uh, hard workers, uh, transit lines, uh, rail, water, St. Lawrence Seaway, Great Lakes, Mississippi River, raw materials, lumber from up north, Wisconsin, elsewhere raw materials and everything else from the Rust Belt, from Pennsylvania on through in Ohio, and really being the midpoint, if you look at where Transcontinental Railroad was back in the 1800s, 
with Chicago being kind of like, in quotes, the center of the West and the more mature East Coast. So I think all of those reasons, forgetting about Al Capone and all the other generalization of the mob being here, truly that was the reason for everybody kind of being located here. And I think that, you know, it has endured and remained. Right now, if you count the boutiques, the startups and everything else, you have about 16 pinball companies. The majority of everything that is happening, whether it is in no rank order, Stern, Jersey Jack, Chicago Gaming, American Pinball, are all located here. Spooky, not that far away in Benton. You know, you have Canada, you have Germany, you have the Netherlands, you have all of these other places. You have China in terms of what Mike is doing. Uh, so I think that, you know, Chicago still remains an epicenter for business and industry, and I think that that was why it happened. Um, I've been asked that question. I've also answered, I can't give you an answer as to why Detroit is the center for automotive, as it was. I mean, things have changed. Probably the same reason. A ready workforce, uh, the production capabilities, getting raw materials, being able to ship stuff out to, we'll call it four corners of the states, but also four corners of the world. And I think that that becomes part and parcel if you look at the history of many industries, not just coin-operated amusement games. Let's face it, you could have asked the same question as to why Silicon Valley for video games? Nobody ever asks me that. And why? Because it was so close to the Far East where so much technology was coming out of China, out of Japan, out of India. It's a port. Hi, guess what? We're going to be in Sunnyvale. Now it's Silicon Valley. It's where Apple's going. It's where Microsoft is going, whether it is along the coast and not in California, but up in Redmond. Gus just has easily gone elsewhere. Austin, Texas has become its own vital spot in regard to design for video games and movies and other things of that nature in terms of our technologically driven entertainment. So I think that we wind up seeing where the hotbeds are where people wind up locating or relocating to be there in that action. So go back to, again, the 1920s, 1930s. Hi, we're in Chicago. So hopefully that answers the question. Uh, if anybody disagrees, please feel free. What do I know? Uh, and uh, just try to give you a little perspective. I do like the History Channel. Uh, if you ever catch things about the men that changed the world, whether it's food and whether it's other things, there are some marvelous, great programs that they wind up uh, airing that have been done. And uh, some of what I picked up is not from there, but I'm just saying that uh, there's some good stuff out there to learn and hear about and read about. So, yeah. My, my grandfather <coughs> moved from Dallas, Texas to uh, Chicago in 1927, same year my dad was born. He was a baby on the train. And like Roger said, they moved to Chicago for the manufacturing. Uh, that's where everything was located. If you wanted to make something, Chicago had the, uh, the skilled craftsmen, the tool and die guys, the, the woodworkers. Um, Gottlieb started with the husky grip tester. You'd put in a penny and uh, you pull the thing as hard as you can to see how you test your grip and see how uh, strong it was. So yeah, I think it was just purely a function of this is where all the talent was and uh, it drew people from from all around. From four corners of the earth. I mean, look, Montague Redgrave in 1871, Cincinnati, Ohio. Not all that far from Chicago. Harry Williams made the journey to move here after starting off on the West Coast. So, you know, by the time he had created whatever he had created, it had already been knocked off by the time it got to the East Coast. So he figured, screw it, I can bridge that gap and by moving here, working for Bally, working for others, carve out a name for himself, which he obviously did. So anyway, we can get into more of this stuff. Were there <laughs> more questions or are you guys ready to kind of see the movie for the first time or the 15th time? Okay. Sounds good.